what the five things are, the five leadership priorities now that ChatGPT tells us is prioritizing student learning. It came up first. I was like, yes, that's what we should be doing. We are educational institutions. I'm very excited about this. So prioritizing student learning was one. Creative, creating inclusive learning environments. That was two. Like, how does this computer know this, right? The computer figured this out. Um, supporting teachers, staff, and administrators. Are we all feeling that we need some support? I might have added administrators in myself. It might have said teachers and staff, but I think our administrators are tired, you know, from everything. Just, you know, we all are. Um, embracing technology. So I thought that was perfect you know, for our audience here, the great, and fostering collaborative partnerships, which I think we are also all seeing as a need because if, if we don't have a belief in our potential as institutions and for the future, I think we're in a precarious spot, right, as we look at that, but I thought that was so fun. So it's gonna be great to see how the things we're doing in Park City School District, you know, if you see any of these themes emerge because the PowerPoint was created separately from the chat GPT. I just was curious to see what it might, you know, what it might tell me about leading schools now and uh, future learning. So let me see, I'm gonna play with this. Little clicker, make sure I do it the right way. Here we go. So our mission in Park City School District was reimagined or redesigned or recalibrated by the community in 1718. So I wasn't in the district at that point. I wasn't part of that particular community convening, but I really like value support, use this as our guiding principle, right? So our mission and our vision directs the things that we do in the district. Our mission is to inspire and support all students equitably to achieve their academic and social potential. So before any of the polarization, politicization, you know, any of the triggering of words, the district had this belief and this push to really look at equitable practices, equitable outcomes for students, and the disparities that we have within the system. So inspiring and supporting all students equitably is really what drives us. And uh, it's something we really, uh, we deeply feel in the system. Our vision is really the national definition of whole child education been around for a long time, you probably all know this, but again, in the system, we make our decisions based on these principles, that our, our, our system is student-centered with a focus and an emphasis on being our students and our staff, we've kind of expanded that since the pandemic, are safe, supported, engaged, challenged, and healthy. Right, so if we make decisions along those five principles, we feel like we are doing the right things on behalf of our whole child uh, system. So those are just some of the basic um, tenants that have been in the district since 1718. Prior to 1718, the district was known as a district of innovation and choice. I don't think those were bad either. I think those are kind of timeless themes as well, but this just kind of, uh, narrowed in and, and uh, tuned the community in and was inspired by the community as well as to what we want for our kids. So I really believe that foundational direction is important for us. But we in Park City School District, like many of you, we are working on all the things that help us to reimagine the student experience. How do we leverage the concept of future ready schools to design a system that is going to elevate all? How do we ensure equitable practices and outcomes? Um, I was sharing this morning that at our regional Sterling Scholar Competition, we were the only district in our region, I'm not talking statewide, just region, the only district that had two multilingual language learners as part of our Sterling Scholar panel, and one in English, and, you know, for the English category. So pretty exciting. We did well this year. 17 kids participated, every category. Do you all know Sterling Scholars, what that is, right? Such a great opportunity for kids to highlight uh, strengths across the academic and arts areas. They're really fun. Um, we are a competency-based education, um, interested district, right? We don't have everything in place yet, but we want to get there. 
Um, we really do align to Utah's portrait of a graduate. We did not redesign it locally. We um, stuck with the mastery, autonomy, and purpose and all the different categories. We're just looking at how to measure those. Uh, we believe in trying to personalize the learner experience using technology to enhance education. We've been a one-to-one -one district for quite a while. Uh, Justin, you might know that even, how long we've been. So we're at least a dozen years, right? Yeah, oh, at least. Yeah, so more, so yeah. we've had the one-to-one. -one. We are an Apple or Mac-based district. We use iPads and then um, MacBook Airs for kids. And we have about a seven-year recycle cycle. So we do actually get good use our elementary kids do not take the devices home, which is how we get the good use of the link and then, um, you know, imaging uh, throughout. Uh, we do try to use authentic um, assessments, you know, things that challenge kids but are uh, project-based and that they can demonstrate and show what they're learning. We um, believe in amplifying learner agency, voice, and choice. We have a student on the board. We um, visit the board, a couple of board members, and I visit with student leadership groups every month. Uh, we try to really hear what kids are telling us about their environment and about their experience. We have great career pathways for kids, everything from the technical lens to aviation, which is really fun. Aviation is a newer program for us. Um, kids can graduate with a drone certification, and believe it or not, you know, drone photography is pretty popular. Um, the aviation pathway is really um, taking flight. Ha, ha, ha. But, yeah, they uh, they really love it. Um, we do embrace cultural responsiveness, but a lots lots of heavy duty work on equitable outcomes, and not always easy. You know, not always easy. Um, and then we do have customized academic social emotional learning support. So we're fully PBIS and MTSS and all the acronyms. Right? We got all the acronyms going on. Um, our North Star is the portrait of the graduate. So it is that mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And we do stick, stay pretty aligned to the state of Utah direction, you know, to the USB direction. Um, and we're, we're happy with this. We didn't feel we had to tweak it or modify it. We felt like if we just stay aligned with the state, because very often the state, you know, in Utah, we have some really nice policies that allow us to move beyond what other states um, have. So uh, we didn't feel we needed to, to tweak this too much. So the mastery autonomy purpose is part of our North Star along with the vision and mission. In our pathways, this kind of got wonky, sorry about that, I just have it as a list. Um, but PCBL provides the pathway. So the culture of learning, learner agency, how we demonstrate our knowledge, our customized supports, and our social emotional learning. So um, building out this understanding of what is uh, PCBL is really important in our district right now. And we're doing that with all kinds of fun things. You know, we have little short uh, clips, little videos, or little info sheets. Uh, question of the week for staff and we were finding different ways to get staff kind of engaged in what is this and how do we do it exactly and when we see it happening we celebrate it a lot and recognize it because a lot of this is happening it's just how do we scale it right how do we scale it so that every child can benefit um, in navigating this journey we are a professional learning community district how many of you do the, the PLC type work really important we have a principal's PLC we have grade levels, we have content areas, we have all the different ways of building um, capacity to that. Um, at BUD, we are finding we're at that stage of PLC work where we have so many new people, we have to kind of go back to what is the basic, you know, what is a PLC and why is it important and what problems are we trying to solve and you know, what things are we focusing on. It is not planning the field trip. That's not what <laughs> PLC is for. Um, still have to talk about that 20 years later. but. I'm not bitter <laughs> about that, uh, but it, you know, it provides right, that continuous improvement and it is kind of fun to, to remember and, and rethink you know, why we're doing this, uh, why are we doing the PLCs. We are seeing key shifts and uh, we do not partner as of this moment with any one particular external partner, but we do believe partnering externally is important because we can do a lot in the box as we're reimagining and redesigning, but we kind of need some help um, to not do it just on our own. So we look at lots of different organizations. I don't know if any of you were part of Magellan. Our district went to Magellan this year. Oh my gosh. 
they came back inspired, supported. If you don't know what it is, keep an ear out for it. Magellan Conference locally, where we're talking about different organizations that can help support these key shifts, moving from a, a school-centered, adult-centered system towards a learner-centered environment. What does that look like? What does that feel like for the adult? What does it feel like for the student? Um, how can we vision it? How can we make that happen? And these are some of the key shifts that we see. Um, responding to kids' needs in a timely way, knowing the kids really well, um, knowing that the goal is learning. It's not teaching, right? That's a big shift um, anymore. So the goal is learning. All right, my friend from Salt Lake City. This is right from your school district. How many of you have seen this already? All right, if you have not seen this, this is, was Why actually filmed um, in the Salt Lake City School District. I think we're not ready that we are. We were watching the news the other day and we saw this story on kids and social media. People keep saying that kids are depressed. Why do you think that is? The world is scary. COVID-19. Social media. Maturation. Not admitting when I'm hurting. My eyes were red when I cried, but I just said I was on my phone too much. There are more ways to bully kids than there used to be. You used to just punch somebody or kick them, but now there are so many ways people can hurt you. I don't want that for myself. Something held up. My heart. What do you think adults are worried about? With nothing. I think adults are just afraid of what we're gonna learn. Someone you can scar them for life with things they're not supposed to know. Told me not to cry. I think they want to protect us from awful things and bad information. Still, it makes no sense. What do you mean? Now that we're kids. We're curious. I'm older. We still learn all these things just without support. My if you tell if there's something we shouldn't know, we'll go out and find the worst version of it. <laughs> the world's more complicated now. Say that it's a lie. We have access to all information and each other anytime we want. It's here on our phones. It's hard for adults to help us because no one's ever grown up with this. Maybe the problem is that you want to prepare us for the world as it was when you were a kid instead of the world as it is today. What should we be teaching you? I don't argue without getting angry. Teach us to have disagreements without freaking out. We need to teach us how to talk about hard things. We just need adults we trust to share the truth with us. Children, wake up. Hold your mistake up before they. Is school the right place to be talking about these tough things? ¿Dónde más se supone que debemos aprender a hacer del mundo un lugar mejor que en la escuela? If that's not the point of school, then what is? If the children don't grow up, our bodies get bigger, but our hearts get torn up. This is school. This is where we're supposed to learn hard things and then use what we learn to fix problems. School is supposed to make you more successful, right? School is where we learn to be leaders in our community. We need people to tell us what's wrong and why it's wrong so we can fix it. Teach us scary things where it's safe in our classroom. It's like that story we saw about students not being able to read certain books or talk about certain things because they're scary. Teach us. Guide us. Believe in us. You can't protect us, but you can prepare us. If I'm not taught about global warming, that won't stop the globe from warming. <laughs> I think it's healthy to recognize that some of the world's problems come from here. Why? Because then we can do better. It's a lot of so we'll figure it out. We have to make social media the solution, not the problem. Now the whole world is connected and all of us can stand up and learn together. We have more tools than any generation before. We're the most likely to solve the world's biggest problems. Any last thoughts? Wake up to the pain in yourself and others. Help others find some joy. ¿Qué pasa si somos los héroes que hemos estado esperando? So thank you to John Arturo 
for that video. That's his classroom. So I don't know if any of you know him or of him. He was the Utah State Teacher of the Year a couple of years ago and really advocate for students, you know, for youth, for growth, for um, awareness. And I'm sure some of this might have linked to our last legislative session. Maybe some of the things we're talking about locally in our state. Um, our future is we are going through a realignment where we have um, five, four, four of our seven schools currently under construction, under renovation. So we are building capacity for a universal pre K, which is certainly not required in Utah, but um, we know the daycare challenges and early learning challenges across. Um, our area, the West, you know, we're kind of a daycare desert, so universal pre-K is one of the capacities we're building. Also going to the 6-8 um, middle school model, we currently have a 6-7 and then an 8-9, so we're trying to avoid, you know, one of those shifts. Our youngest kids kind of run across campus in 8th and 9th to access high school courses in an, an imperfect bell system, right, so we're trying to do that in a comprehensive high school where the kids can really access, we have a, a, an amazing course catalog. We have over 250 courses, but our ninth graders don't usually have access to them because they're not in the building where the courses are offered. So we'll have a four-year high school. We are also building the capacity for wrap services, again, modeled after a program in Salt Lake City um, where we do have that ability. I don't know the name of the school. I don't remember the name of the school, but I visited it in Salt Lake. It's amazing. So you have the community services where you can do screenings for hearing or vision or dental and try to um, provide some support for your families. Um, we are trying to reduce those transitions. So we'll have the K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12, and then students are driving their learning across all kinds of creative career pathways. So our leadership priorities now, um, we actually look at the acronym of RISE. Um, those teacher and this was actually principal just the other day I was touring a school with a new board member and a student had an idea about bringing in a math app a math game app and was talking to the principal about it and why it would be a helpful tool for the kids to have and how they can learn from it it was so cute just in the moment you know kids have ideas of what they need or what might help them the great instructional capacity, we're trying to build that across the system, support for our staff, for our students, for our families, equitable outcomes and process, and then embracing technology. So we kind of linked pretty well to what chat GPT told me um, are the leadership priorities now, so that's kind of fun. The other thing that we're really finding since the time of the pandemic, and I think you're probably all seeing this too, is the strategies around how we bolster both individual and organizational resilience, right? We've been through a lot. It's not getting really easier. So what I learn and what I often learn when we create a presentation, often it is the presentation I need as well. So I wound up doing a lot of research, a lot of study on organizational resilience and what our employees really needed. Um, and certainly one of a, a few teacher conversations kind of informed um, this finding, but really employee needs, right? We just as humans need to be heard, protected, prepared, just like the students said in the video, supported and know that we care to get our best results. As we're here today together, I hope that we are uh, taking care of ourselves and one another. I think that's probably our most important leadership priority now, um, bolstering one another, showing that we are a network that cares across the state, and we are going to keep one another safe. Um, we're gonna keep adjusting. We're going to have some time for joy and laughter together, but that taking care of one another and, our, and um, ourselves in our roles so that we can bring our best self each day is critically important, and I say that, don't always do that. Like, I'll be the one who's eating the fun carbs and not sleeping and, you know, those kinds of things, but at least I know what we should be doing, right? That's important. And then our, uh, you know, just thank you. Thank you for everything you're bringing to the room. You know, courage to have some hard conversations of maybe um, putting some emphasis on where we could be that we're not. Um, the tenacity that we're all using to get through these uh, challenging times, the strength, the kindness, care, compassion, and love that you all show each and every day. Thank you so much. I really value the time with all of you today.